Raul Meza Torres is not your regular teen after he achieved the feat that puts his name as one of Mexico's most ruthless cartel assassins. But how did this situation turn bad for the kid who missed his way early in life, and how he ended up paying the ultimate price? Could the situation have turned out differently for him as some people have claimed? Make sure you watch this video to the end as we discuss the sad story of El Mini 6. Before we start the video, be sure to leave a like, subscribe to the channel, and also hit the notification button so you get notified every time I drop those videos. Now that you've got that out of the way, let's dig in. The debate about being naughty by nature or nurture always comes up in discussions involving kids and teens. Like, are all these characters they exhibited built in or are they influenced by their environment? One thing clear enough though is that we'll always find it difficult to agree. Real Meza Torres grew up to become everything surrounding him, the drugs, the violence, killings, and whatever you could ever imagine. Born to Raul Meza Ontiveros, aka LM6, who himself was a drug kingpin and a top shot of the powerful Sinaloa cartel, Raul Meza Torres, aka El Mini 6, was born in the Mexican state of Sinaloa on the 31st of October 1991. Infamously known as the drug capital of Mexico, Sinaloa dominance in the drug world tops it all. As a matter of fact, ask any Mexican about the city, and the first things they think of are drugs and violence. No cap. His father wasn't the only connection. Raul Meza Torres, aka El Mini 6, had with the underworld. He also had uncles and cousins, who were involved in one way or the other. So could he really have avoided joining them in all honesty? I don't think so. His father, Raul Meza Ontiveros, aka LM6, alongside his uncles Javier Torres Felix aka LJT and Manuel Torres Felix aka SLM1 were all deeply involved in the organized crime world. Doesn't that mean everything around the family involves killings, shootings, police raids and the likes? A young Raul Meza Torres however couldn't resist the urge of wanting to be just like his father because let's be real the crime underworld doesn't just end all gloom with the shootings, murders and police raids. They also have the cash to buy and flaunt the luxuries, fast cars, gold chains, and um, you know, the hot ladies. This is actually one of the cartel's selling points to young dudes who wish to toe that line. It's easy for them to ignore the hard parts and focus on the enjoyment. Like all kids his age, Raul Meza Torres was also inspired by all he saw as well as his father's presence in the game. This made him join the Sinaloa cartel fully at the young age of 15. Shouldn't he be focused on school, some might ask, but trust me. It ain't a joke in Mexico. In fact, we have kids younger than that who are already deeply involved in that life. For Raul Meza Torres, it wasn't even like that was the beginning for him, as he had been alleged to have been involved in several other criminal activities before deciding to switch it up fully by joining the Sinaloa cartel. That journey, however, wasn't really what he expected, and what made his case different wasn't even the path he chose, but the way and manner which it all ended. Going fully into the underworld at age 15 and getting killed within three years of joining, one would imagine if that period was enough to make one's mark in the organized crime world. But for Raul Meza Torres, he sure left behind a legacy within such a short period of time. He might have been killed at the age of 18, but he still had songs dedicated to him even after his death, which is to show you that Mini 6 wasn't your regular cartel kid. Real Meza Torres went on to become one of the Sinaloa cartel's youngest assassins, allegedly though, and he didn't in any way hide that from so many people. He sure made good use of social media platforms, most especially Facebook and Metroflog, which he used frequently to post his day-to-day -day activities. What really separates Raul Meza Torres from teens his age was what he posted through such platforms. His timeline was filled with pictures of himself posing with firearms and flashing luxuries. Several pictures of him holding and firing assault weapons soon became a theme on his social media accounts. These kinds of posts, made by Raul Meza Torres, soon made him a kind of a local celebrity amongst teens of his age, with many of them wanting to be just like him. But were they able to intimidate just that? Your guess is absolutely right. Raul Meza Torres soon became the face of the young dudes joining cartels known as Mini Zetas, a movement which is becoming problematic for the Mexican government as kids between the ages of 16 and 19 are sent to training camps to learn how to handle weapons as well as oversee drug operations. Raul Meza Torres was, however, struck a heavy blow on the 27th of March 2007 when his father and mentor, Raul Meza Ontiveros, aka LM6, was shot and killed by rival cartel members during a shootout. At that time, there were conflicting reports about how he was killed, with some claims he was dropping off his girlfriend when rivals who had been waiting for him shot him at close range. Maybe that should have been a point where Raul Meza Torres would retrace his steps, 
but it seems he was more deeply rooted in the underworld than you can imagine. Seven months after his father was ambushed and killed by rival cartels, Raul Meza Torres also had his first run-in with the Mexican law enforcement. Just 15 years of age at that time, he was pulled over by cops for driving an armored vehicle without license plates. He was then arrested after he was unable to show proof of the ownership of the vehicle. Moving forward, on the 19th of June 2009, which is about two years after the first incident, Raul Meza Torres also had another problem with the law enforcement authorities. Raul Meza Torres was participating in a drag race in the region of Las Quintas when traffic officers decided to spoil the party. What could have been easily handled by both parties soon degenerated into chaos when the officers ordered the racing to be stopped. Some of those present decided to fire shots at the police, leaving one officer injured. This led to a shootout as officers were forced to return fire. The shooters were eventually overpowered and outgunned by the police officers and were forced to flee the scene, leaving one of their vehicles behind. When state authorities arrived at the location to later investigate the crime scene, they found that the abandoned vehicle was owned by Meza Torres and that there was a license plate inside the vehicle that matches one that had earlier been reported stolen. It wasn't only that though, as they found several caches of ammunition. Real Meza Torres might have had a run-in with the authorities twice, but it still didn't stop him from constituting nuisance as well as portraying himself as a menace. Could he have even retraced his footsteps before it was too late? Who knows? The two incidents involving Raul Meza Torres and the authorities didn't really yield the expected result. It was never reported if he had any punishment for the run-ins, but why was that the case? Could the outcome of the story have turned out different assuming he had been punished for those offenses? Maybe time in juvenile might have helped him in retracing his steps. No one's sure, but it might have helped. The climax of the whole story, however, occurred on the 25th of April, 2010. That Sunday morning started like every other day for Raul Meza Torres until police officers patrolling in the Las Aguilas neighborhood in Zapopan, Jalisco, noticed a suspicious vehicle during a stop and frisk operation. The occupants of the suspicious vehicle turned out to be Raul Meza Torres and a friend named Fidel Rojas Felix. The officers ordered them to stop for a routine search, but they ignored the instruction. The occupants of the vehicle were said to have taunted the officers by flashing their weapons and firing shots into the air to warn off the officers. The two officers even tried to calm the situation while asking them to turn themselves in. Maybe at that point, a little caution might have stopped what was to come next, but maybe youthful embrace on the part of Raul Meza Torres and his friend played its part in what unraveled. In a switch moment, Raul Meza Torres was alleged to have shot one of the officers at point-blank range, killing them instantly. The second officer was also shot with gunshot wounds suffered on his hand, leg, and thorax. It was a defining moment for the young Raul Meza Torres because at this point, there was no turning back. It's one thing to kill rival drug cartel members, but it's another thing to be a cop killer. The die was cast at that point. The second officer who survived the shots wasn't ready to go down without putting up a fight though. He returned fire, which hit Raul Meza Torres. He later died of his injuries as they were life-threatening. His friend who was also involved was rather lucky as he didn't get shot. He however attempted to escape from the scene but was caught on a rooftop by officers responding to the shootings. Even though authorities were able to confirm that Raul Meza Torres and his friend belonged to the Sinaloa cartel, his friend denied he had anything to do with the shooting. The autopsy report on Raul Meza Torres later confirmed that he died from gunshot wounds as well as multiple blunt injuries to his head, which reports claimed was likely from pistol whipping. Even though no further investigations were carried out after the incident, it still raised the question of how Raul Meza Torres was really killed. If he had succumbed to his gunshot wound, then why was there any reason for the officers to pistol whip him? Or was it carried out while he had been shot and writhing in pain on the floor? No one knows for sure, but the only one who would seem to walk out of this unhurt was his friend and accomplice, Rojas Felix, who was later charged with homicide and attempted homicide. Even though Raul Meza Torres died as a teenager, several narco corridos detailing his life and death have been composed by musicians. Raul Meza Torres turned out to be swallowed by the drug underworld, which has ensured many before him never fulfilled their lifelong ambitions, while many lives after him have also been cut short. Nonetheless, Raul Meza Torres has been remembered unlike many others like him. It is, however, painful to see many young ones like him getting exploited by these cartels with the promise of a better future. A future most of them never get a witness as they either get killed or sentenced to jail terms. The situation doesn't seem like it could be solved too, as many of these kids are just like pawns waiting to be sacrificed in the game. Ten may be dead or maimed, but hundreds are ready and willing to fill those spaces, and the heartbreaking cycle continues. What's your opinion on the story of Raul Meza Torres and how it turned out for him? Do you really think he could have been saved just like thousands of them still out there? Let me know your opinions in the comment section. If you liked the video? Great, we got another one for you that we guarantee you'll like and all you have to do is click on the screen.